uh, <laughs> welcome again uh, viren this is the you know second part uh, carrying on with the conversation um viren uh, you know i know again you know i shouldn't uh, because you um, you're a scholar so you are very particular about these things so uh, you are not a professed a scholar on lusun but i want to raise questions which are slightly more general reflection on uh, larger questions and and we can maybe center around lusun or in the indian context premchand and which is the question which you also touched upon in the earlier conversation and that is if somebody is opposing feudalism and you rightly said you know like right from 500 bc till 1911 that's when the chinese revolution is happening everything before that is all feudalism <laughs> so it's extremely uh, you know violating all sense of uh, what we call periodization you know um uh, so um and then um you know we are fighting for uh modern liberty or liberation or emancipation and all of that uh so in that it becomes very easy later for whatever once you have the rise of what we call neoliberalism or in china with the deng xiaoping uh period of capitalist restoration to use a maoist term <laughs> um the gang of four is like done away with and there's capitalist restoration um the capitalist inroaders or something they used to yeah, say i yeah. think in the culture yeah inroaders so then they can still use lusun and say look you know we are fighting feudalism as you said the feudalism of mao yes. and then say that we are we are modernizing you know we are still doing the same thing which in a different way the communists were also doing um so so here one of the questions then arises is what happened with the entire legacy of uh, marxism leninism or communism uh, particularly in places like china and india which were professedly fighting not so much capitalism uh, but feudalism and imperialism so the focus was not really on capital itself but on the nexus between feudalism and imperialism mm. So in India, the Maoist movement, for example, talks about uh, defining India Indian mode of production as semi-feudal, semi-colonial. The character of the Indian state as semi-feudal, semi-colonial. Now, in this kind of a scenario, it feels like it is yet another project of modernization only, which then gets immediately appropriated by capitalist inroaders, by neoliberals. In Nepal, for example, what happened with the communist movement later the 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 maoist leaders themselves started saying yeah you know what we need is uh, capitalism with nepalese mm. characteristics mm. you know so you briefly of course even uh, in passing mentioned poston people like poston would really be talking about that yes. right yes. and that conference that you yes. talked about yes. so uh, was it a historical mistake for people like mao to elevate lusun the way it was done you know right not that lusun didn't deserve it but the way it was done by giving too much of fetishizing the anti feudal aspect to it you know um so is there any such uh, realization among say people like wang hui what are they saying so about feudalism or about yeah you know this uh, Uh, which then allowed the later capitalist inroaders to use the same figures that were used by the communist parties yes i think um the short answer is definitely yes but there are a number of complex issues um in what you're saying so the first is the problem of feudalism so the thing with feudalism is even though we could say it didn't exist after 220 BC uh again most many would say it didn't exist even before that so that means that you didn't have any feudalism in china and ever and yet the term is so important for understanding 20th century intellectual history 
So in that sense, the question you then have to ask is, how do you look at something like the intellectual history of a concept like feudalism? And what you have to do, and I think this is what you were suggesting, is that you have to look not so much at the referent to feudalism, because that doesn't exist, right? There is no feudalism for most of the period that people are talking about in Chinese history. Rather, what you have to do is look at the effects or the politics of using the term feudalism. So, I mean, this is where I mentioned an essay that I wrote, which is called The Politics of Feudalism. So it's really the politics of using the term feudalism. So what feudalism does is it negates the past and it affirms the present. And it affirms, so, so that's where it is a kind of modernization theory. It affirms, affirms the capitalist present. <laughs> in most cases, right? Yes, except that, so, but that becomes a question of whether you see Mao's China as capitalist, right? Because there are those who would say that's not capitalist. So that becomes another very... Well, let me add a little thing here, you know. Mao himself did say that what we have is more or less capitalism because he said that, you know, uh, that the law of value is still functioning and the principle of distribution is not... Uh, to each according to his needs from each according to his uh, capacity it is still based on labor time yeah. so Mao was aware of some of these things it was like a uh, internal critique of Chinese socialism that 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 uh, that Mao was uh, aware of so okay. just a little anyway, foot just a yeah just a footnote on that I mean I think that's right I think Mao, Mao we have to remember that Mao had a period called you know, new democracy right so yeah. so we have to realize that Mao, in some ways or the other, is still, in many ways, working with a linear perspective, but also trying to break out of it. That's so, what? So, yeah. there's a so there's a tension, yeah. Also. yeah, yeah, because yeah. The, and the linearity is saying, okay, we're socialist, but realizing that we are, we haven't yet had capitalism. Yeah. But for Mao, there's got to be a problem there because socialism is supposed to come after capitalism. So he ends up saying that we can do it with the party. Yeah. And and this, so this kind of linearity is precisely what, where, the, where the term feudalism can, can be of use. Because even if Mao is saying, yes, we're going to overcome feudalism because we want to eventually get to socialism, there's a brief period where he says we have to now keep the capitalists, right? Because we've got to, we've got to have capitalism in some way governed by the party, in which case it's not really capitalism, he says, right? But we can eventually get there, and, but, and then he changes his mind. Then he says, no, we've got to collectivize everything, right, by the 50s. And this is why by the 80s, you get people like Jing Guangtao, the liberals and so on, who began to say, we've got to go back to what Mao was saying in the beginning, right? We've got to go back to new, new, new democracy. We haven't finished that. So this is where it does, you're right, I think it opens the road it, or the door for a kind of modernization, restoration of capitalism. And this is something that someone like Li To, the literary critic, said very early on, right? He's, he calls it the, the Mao style. So he ends up saying that all the liberals and the pro-capitalist people in the 1980s are actually using Mao against Mao. And that's because the Maoist framework itself uh, you know, to the extent that it's a linear framework can still be used to promote capitalism. Because that's sort of what a lot of, because they don't use the term capitalism, but they say, you know, we're going to increase productive forces, right? Or we're going to develop the economy. So those are the terms, that, and those are often, often mean capitalism without saying it. Yeah. Um, and so I think that, that is the thing that I think is, has become very, very, very important. Um, to understanding contemporary China. Now, um, the new left in this are in a very tricky situation because they emerged in the 90s. Someone like Wang Hui, who I think is, you can say, sort of the leader of, of, of this kind of critical thinking, they emerged in the 1990s as being critical of the market reforms. So if you read his works of the 90s, they're often critical of the market reforms, saying that, look, all these reforms, you know, they, they're really 
creating the problems of capitalism. And so China's problems now are the problems of capitalism. Not the, then the liberals would say, no, 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 the, the, the problems of socialism and we need to move further with market reforms and liberals and, and liberal kind of rights and all of that. And I think that, Ma, that, that, that people like Wang Hui started out really affirming you know, the, the other side to say, no, no, we've got to criticize inequality, all the problems of capitalism. But I think as time went on, things got a little more complicated because there's also the, the way you position China in relation to the globe, right? And so this is where you get this, the, the, the affirmation or some kind of affirmation of China at the same time that is contemporary China against the United States, right? And this is really becoming pro pronounced when we think about something like the one belt, one road policy, yeah, 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 right? Because yeah. that's sort of a lot of the, the new left is interested in that because that really looks like it's Asian unity again, almost like third world unity. But now it's not quite socialist oh, on unity. That, on that, Viren, you know, why these people are ending up supporting one road, one border, what is that? One belt, one road. Oh, one belt, uh, one road is because they are, you know, I think it is a, it is, it has nothing to do with Marxism. It has, what it has to do with is this, um, you know, anti-race, anti um, you know, this kind of identitarian kind of uh, politics in which uh, a lot of Marxists have lost their way. So they think that, oh, we have to oppose um, the white supremacist Donald Trump America, right? So we have to be with the immigrants. Uh, we have to be with the uh, brown and black and yellow and all of that, which is actually sounds very progressive, but which ends up precisely as you were saying, you know, maybe supporting, uh, uh, what is that, Basar al-Assad in Syria, supporting uh, China, supporting who knows, maybe Putin. I heard once there was a conference uh, in Russia and... Uh, 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 the great philosopher Alain Badiou <laughs> agreed to come uh, at the invitation of one of the spin doctors of Putin and some of our very sincere Marxist comrades in Russia they were like thinking what is Badiou doing how can he come to this program organized by the henchmen of Putin so um, um, uh, so I think I think I think I think that's what's going on that um, there is a serious um, you know poverty of thought when it comes to how to say handle um, this question of immigration in the West. So you have this enemy which is created which is Western white imperialist project like Donald Trump or Brexit in the UK, France, uh, this Mary Le Pen and all of this. Uh, so I think it's really coming from there. To me it looks like people like Wang Hui are too connected to this global trends in uh, Marxism, you know, mm. um, and, and not really maybe uh, responding from the ground because otherwise there's no way you can fail to see that Modi is uh, someone whom you can never, you know, uh, support as doing some kind of anti-imperialism or something or China or, you know, one belt, uh, one road uh, thing. So, uh, so I think I think within my mind, to me, to me, it looks like we really need to uh, really understand what is going on with people uh, who get a lot of currency in the West. I'm talking about Marxists going from here, yeah. you know, in the West, and what happens to them? How yeah. they get recycled? Yeah. Yeah. Because the Western left might think of, uh, you know, of uh, uh, an Indian strong man like Modi as not that bad, you know, they might think, oh, Trump is worse than Modi or something like that, you know. Um, uh, so, uh, um, so, so, so for them, their priority is fighting Modi, uh, fight, fighting Trump <laughs> rather than fighting uh, Modi. So I think, I think where you are located then becomes very important, you know. Uh, maybe from a, if you are a Western Marxist, you think, oh, what Trump is doing uh, with the Mexican border is far uh, diabolical and evil than what China is doing in Africa, mm. right? Uh, I have another quibble with you. 
and i just will just take a few minutes and i want to hear from you also because i was wondering what wang hui would think about particularly about mao um i was telling you i was trying to i was i was exerting myself even though i know you know there's a i i i, I don't know how i can Uh, put across this point because you are a china scholar you read chinese you know china very well i'm sitting here and i'm trying to give you a different uh, view point on on mao um, uh, <laughs> but it's just that mao is also regarded as 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 an icon in india you know so 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 i don't really think of mao as chinese yeah. so as a chinese scholar you yeah. think i am Uh, doing discursive violence you know in in trying to make some claims about mao but on the question of linearity to me it looks like mao is the most non linear thinker ever uh and it's so tough to find linearity in mao uh so when someone comes and says mao is linear but yeah he was little bit non linear here and there to me it looks like it's the other way around I think some uh, some I maybe it's Slavoj Zizek or someone who said that Mao was an anarchist or something like that you know uh, or Badiou also saying okay you 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 have the revolution you do away with the old structure old capitalist or old ruling classes and then in the cultural revolution you say bombard the headquarters yeah. you bring all the red guards and everyone on the street I mean beyond a point you know it feels like coming from a marxist position you will have to emphasize oh no but we need stable structures we need a state we need a bureaucracy and it feels like in the cultural revolution what mao was doing was like he was like uh, i don't know a nietzschean <laughs> uh, nietzschean bakuninian <laughs> kind of an anarchist the way he was going you know and the other thing if one is talking about the question of feudalism after 1949 okay it feels like mao is also part of the capitalist modernization project but mao says the feudalism is located in the party itself right the party has started reproducing of course he said the party is reproducing new capitalists yeah. you know um uh, and uh, but he would also say uh, new feudals you know the, the supervisors say at the factory level so there are the the supervisors are still domineering over the worker yes. uh, you know at the base level and the cultural revolution had all these uh, messages now does an intellectual like wang hui uh, really take this into account or he just uh, doesn't think uh, these are important aspects about mao to talk about so um you've put a lot of things on the table there so let me let me uh let me try to get to what i can um so the first issue um having to do with the kind of the the global situation the rise of modi and the critique of imperialism i think so definitely has to be dealt with because in some ways you brought it up when you mentioned this idea of the semi feudal semi imperialist which is a maoist idea that both the the uh i guess the indian left so some of the indian left them and and the chinese left both of them use and so i think one thing to really keep in mind is this problem of imperialism the problem of imperialism is is really sort of going out of fashion in the west S- to the effect i mean a really good example is the debate between prabhat patnaik and um and David Harvey I don't know if you've seen that around Prabhat Patnaik's book which is a theory of imperialism and this was a book that really stresses or even what we saw we saw with Postone and Utsa Patnaik right yeah. where they both got really upset and each saying no you don't understand Marx you don't understand Marx um and the key here is of course that uh Prabhat Patnaik and Utsa Patnaik see imperialism as a fundamental part of capitalism So from this perspective American imperialism is in in many ways the condition for the possibility of capitalism. So in this context they're going to have very different perspectives on nationalism. But that doesn't mean that the Indian left supports Modi, right? I mean in many ways Ajaz Ahmed all of these people they're very anti-Modi. But being anti-Modi 
does not mean you're going to be anti-nationalist. And I think yeah. to the question, so I think the, the whole problem is going to be, well, how do we develop another type of nationalism? Yeah. And this is where one, one has to think. I mean, w what we've got on the table are, on the one hand, global capitalism, neoliberalism, and then some kind of right-wing nationalism. Yeah. And we can't choose between them. Yeah. And, and I think this is, this is the, the very difficult political situation that we're in. Um, and, and of course, in that situation, you might, and this is something that Takeuchi Yoshimi had to do as well. I mean, okay. this is where he had to, you know, you, you began to look at fascism and began to see, well, you know, maybe it's not that bad, you know, that kind of thing, that maybe there's something good within it, right? And that's why Takeuchi Yoshimi is so controversial, right? Because he looks at the Japanese, you know, the imperialist fascist regime, and he says, well, okay, it was very bad, but it was still critical of the United States. We don't want to forget <laughs> that, right? And so that becomes the kind of, and he says, then he ends up saying it's imperialism against imperialism. So now the question... Sounds, sounds like a one we... Yeah, 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 it is. I, mean, I, I actually think they're very similar in, in some ways. Uh, but, but now, of course, what Wang Hui, of course, is very critical yeah. of the Japanese, given that he's Chinese. But, he's, but, but, but there, there's something there, I think, that, that one really has to look at when once one steps down from the level of high theory... Uh, where it's very clear, to, easy to say it's all wrong, and so, and then starts going into the level of geopolitics. Then I think you begin to see some of the the, the contradictions. And well, well, I mean, you begin to have a, at least a different perspective on nationalism, that you can have a left wing nationalism. And in fact, this is something Ajaz Ahmed himself says, right? He says that the whole problem is if you don't have a left wing nationalism the right-wing nationalism is going to immediately f come there to fill its place. And I think that has been the failure of the left ever in, in various places. Um, so that's, that's on the question of nationalism. And then the other question is the question of Mao and non-linearity. I, non I think you're absolutely right. You can find a lot of this non-linearity in, in Mao. In fact, that's probably what he's more, more famous for, almost. And someone like Wang Hui really likes to stress that. Because remember, once you do that, and this is where I'm being a little cynical. Um, Does he take that to another extreme again? Well, what he's going to say is, look, it can, he can be postmodern, right? Because after all, if you're nonlinear, you can be postmodern. So this is, why, this is one of the reasons why maybe Zizak and all, they start getting into Mao, right? Um, because they can see him as... But they're doing it as a critique of Mao, not celebrating this aspect. No, well, well, yeah, well Wang, you know, Hui, but, but, Wang Hui would definitely Wang Hui, Wang Hui definitely would want to celebrate this aspect. Oh, okay, yeah, okay, I think uh, okay. because that's the whole thing that it, there is not. So, for example, the example he gives is the example of class, right? So, class is something that you usually think of as this objective kind of thing, right? But the whole thing that with Mao is that through subjective practice you right. can change your class, yeah. and that's something that he sees as very pow powerful. I mean, the, the Chinese Revolution, he says, wouldn't have happened without that, right? Oh, that's right. right? Because you have all these intellectuals, Mao yeah, himself, yeah, yeah. who can become, become a different class. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So and also the primary and the, uh, the antagonistic and non-antagonistic Yeah, yeah, contradictions. yeah, contradictions, yeah, well, that's yeah, all, yeah. So, know, so yeah. those kind of things, I think, are really what make Mao sort and of popular. And Althusser was so influenced by Mao's... Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah, but I think Mao is, but but Althusser, there's still a lot of there's a structuralism there yeah. still. Well, I think what's happened, I think, really is in in contemporary Western theory, is there's two different sides: the structure, and then and then the much more the agency part, right? The subjectivity part, which I, where I think Zizek comes out on that side more, right? Because the influence of Hegel and and Lacan and all of that kind of stuff, I think, uh, which again can be, you know, you can you can. Hmm. My last query. I think we are running out of time. My last query is, you know, in India we have this one book called the Shanghai Textbook on Political Economy yeah. that circulates among our circles, particularly among those of us who support the Maoist movement here and all. We regard it as an essential reading. Yeah. And uh, it does a Shanghai Textbook on Political Economy actually exist <laughs> in China or do you think we just... Uh, you know, and is it is it uh, is it known in China this textbook? Yes, I think it is known in China. Um, yeah. I just um, I haven't discussed it that much in China. Yeah. Um, 
But I think it is it is a very important because it's the whole critique of Soviet economics yeah. is linked to that textbook, and that I think soon I think we're going to see more and more um, importance given to that book because I think um, more and more people are getting interested in the problem of value in China and those value debates, yeah. right? The debates that happened in the 50s about whether the value form exists in China. I mean, this, is, this I think is a very important problem even for Marxism, right? Yeah. Does value, does the term value make sense for Marx in a non-capitalist yeah. society, right? So remember, these people are all agreeing that, ca- that China is socialist, yeah. but they want to say that the value form still exists. Right. And this is a debate that, you know, even someone like uh, the, the French Marxist Jacques Bidet Right, says that value could exist in other societies as long as you had a market, yeah. right? Um, now in China, whether you had a market or not is another story, but it's surplus value that is unique to capitalism. But, but on the Postonian reading, from the very beginning, Marxist capitalist, the categories are all specific to capital. So value cannot exist in a non-capitalist society. So this is a, de- a, a, a debate that goes on even today in Marxism. Yeah. And you know, they were having that in socialist countries in, you know, in Russia and in China. And I think this is why that Mao's uh, critique of Soviet economics is going to be very important because it's very important for the, for the reason that it's an, a way that one can start separating the Chinese experience from the, from the Stalinist yeah. experience. Yeah. And that, I think, was very important, uh, perhaps definitely for the left, for the Maoist left everywhere, yeah. right? Because Mao was the hope for a lot of intellectuals, people like Takeuchi Yoshimi in Japan yeah. and that whole mad Japanese Maoist. You also have in the West the French Maoists. Yeah. They were all, they all ha- really had the hope that Mao was going to be something very different from Stalin, right? Yeah. And this is why the emphasis on the non-linearity is also going to be, is going to be very important from, for, yeah. the, for the West, yeah. right? Yeah. And I would say the non-linearity and the discussion on the law of value which happened in China, right. which for some reason all these very avant-garde the Marxist, Marxist scholars in the West, including Postone or... Um, or uh, Jacques Bidet and then you have this entire Italian autonomist also yeah. always talking about the law of value um, you know as the core of, uh, of of Marx you know capital volume one yeah. and it's so interesting that in China uh, without being very pedantic and scholarly people actually grappled with these questions of yeah. the notion of value yes. <laughs> Um, anyways, uh, I think we're running short of time. Uh, Viren, thank you so much for this conversation. Thank you very much. And uh, it was really uh, a pleasure talking to you. Thank you for having me. Thank you.